Well, first off, guys, thanks for taking the time to talk. Uh, appreciate it. I know we've had a little trouble trying to get things ranged with it, with <laughs> your guys' busy schedule and everything, with the, the game sure, development man. and all the pieces. So I know it's a pain. I know you guys have a lot going on, so I always appreciate taking the time. No, our pleasure. So, so, so we yeah. finally got all sorted out. <laughs> so we'll start off with the basics. Uh, basics, excuse me. Um, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves, let us know who you represent, and kind of what your position is within the group. Cool. Uh, my name is Charlie Price. I'm one of the co-founders of Hidden Variable. I'm also the CCO or creative director, whatever you want to use. Um, and uh, yeah, we founded the studio uh, back in uh, in early 2011. Technically late 2010, but realistically it was like you know the, the last couple of days of December, so early 2011. Um, and yeah, that's that's my position at Hidden Variable. Cool. Uh, uh, my name is Nick Ahrens, and I'm the uh, creative producer here at Hidden Variable Studios. I've been here for about uh, over two years now, and um, I handle a lot of things, everything from business development to kind of helping oversee all the projects in general. Um, it's like the other piece of Charlie's puzzle piece a little bit uh, <laughs> in terms of the way we kind of run the projects and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, and among the other staffers as well. So. Yeah. I mean, as, as with those things in indie development, uh, you know, creative positions often end up overlapping with business positions, yeah. which overlap with production positions. So <laughs> many hats are worn right. simultaneously yeah, we, all around. So. There's, re there's really like, we, ha we have roles and titles, but everyone really pitches in to kind of help out with everything here. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like refusing to recognize that title almost. It's like, yeah, we just kind of do A through whatever needs to get done. I've seen yeah. that in a lot of groups I've talked to. That's that's definitely very interesting and unique for the Yeah, in, internally we don't really think about our titles very often. We just kind of figure out what needs to get done and, and move forward. So. Yeah. yeah, all right. Except when somebody, somebody does something wrong, I'm sure. Then the titles matter. <laughs> 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 well, how did you both get involved in game development in the first place? Um, especially since you guys have a large focus on mobile games, why kind of going that realm as well? Um, well, I'll start, and then I know uh, yeah. Nick, Nick had his own path as well. I mean, I've always been into games. Um, you know, I, I've been interested in, um, you know, I, I was always creating games, whether they were little pen and paper RPGs or, you know, first starting with modules and then entire game systems and things like that, uh, just for fun when I was a kid. Um, I, I think I really kind of started to learn about what the business of game development actually was when um, I started reading uh, Next Gen Magazine uh, when it first uh, first came out, which I believe is now pretty much Edge. I think it evolved into Edge. But, um, but yeah, it, it started having a lot of articles about the business of game development and the nuts and bolts and talking to people beyond just kind of the, the pitch men or the you know, celebrity designers and things along those lines and really going into the, the nitty gritty of how a game was ultimately made, which then you know, piqued my interest and I started reading Game Developer Magazine way back when um, and then slowly but surely decided this is something that I really wanted to do. Uh, when I went to school, I basically tried to equip myself with as many tools as possible so that I could get into game development by hook or by crook. So um, <laughs> everything from business classes to art classes to engineering classes to writing classes, I just knew that I wanted to do it and I was going to find my way to kind of wedge my way in and, uh, and then kind of take it from there, although design was always kind of my primary passion. Um, and then, yeah, so I graduated from school, got an internship, got lucky with a couple of different places and opportunities, took full advantage, worked really hard, here I am today. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, so that's the short and sweet version. We can go into more detail, but I know Nick had his own path as well. Yeah, my path's a little bit different, you know, I mean, probably similar to Charlie. I, I started by just, you know, playing video games and kind of reading whatever was available. I think I was uh, a game pro guy when I was pretty young, and um, I... Uh, you know, trying to figure out my way into the world when I was around 19 years old, I basically begged Game Inform Magazine for an internship, and I refused to leave their office until they hired me. And and lo and behold, <laughs> I was there for about six years and and left as kind of like a senior staffer there. Um, moved out to LA after doing the whole uh, the whole press thing for a very long time and really getting to know the industry from a very interesting angle, especially uh, kind of at a bigger like long lead magazine. And then I came out here and I, I uh, took up. Kind of co-ownership at I'm 8 Bit, which is a uh, creative firm and uh, art gallery that has a big focus in games. And uh, you know, and then I'd known Charlie since uh, my uh, press days. And you know, one day I kind of reached out, going like, "Hey, let's try this development thing." Like I've been interested since I was basically 16 years old, but I never, never did it. And and you know, I I thought they would have no role for me, but Charlie was immediately excited about the idea. And, and I don't know, within not even months, weeks, maybe. Yeah, even, was pretty... I was. Uh, I was on board here, so that's that's the short version of mine as well. Yeah. So. Oh, that's pretty cool. Geez, two very different kind of directions coming to the table with it yet. I like that kind of how you guys both had the idea with it and just brought it together. It's, I'm always fascinated that one of the best things I love about doing this is I love hearing the history of how these groups develop because if you talk to 
any group in the AAA realm, I swear to God, their story could be copy and pasted like a Mad Lib today. It's always oh, yeah. the same kind of premise, the same history. I swear, even the same like collection of six schools they all seem to go to. And it's always <laughs> fun because in the indie realm, you get wide variances from people that you know never did game development in their life, decided to give a, you know, a shot at it, and then people coming out from the press junket, which I think is an interesting path to go into the actual development. I don't know if I would ever want to go that way, mostly because I don't think I'd ever trust my skills as a developer. At least not in games. I, I develop other things. Games, no thank you. I just know. I, the funny thing is, is about half of the people that I know that have left Game Informer have gotten into development uh, in various ways, all various different you know shapes and sizes, large, small, independent, you know, publisher based, um, which is pretty interesting. I think a lot of people had the the itch for it. As you know, you no. sit there and you write about enough video games, you kind of start to get curious of like maybe I could do this. So yeah, and a lot of people those are in creative positions, like yeah. you know, like you know Greg over at Supergiant, you know, who's had a lot of success, and then there's people in production positions. So like whether you're directly kind of in the trenches making the game itself, or you're just kind of involved at a game company yeah. helping great games get made, you know, it's kind of a natural evolution in some ways, you know, for yeah. people that are itching to kind of yeah. get their hands dirty. And I was, I was, you know, I was a, basically the producer of, of Game Informer's reboot of their mag or of their um their website uh, about four years, four or five years ago. So okay. I had a little bit of insight into software development and all that kind of stuff, just kind of coming from that world. But um, uh, you know, at the same time, like I was honestly not at all prepared for what game development was like in, in kind of an exciting way. Like you get in here and you kind of see how the systems are and how, you know, how finite you geek out over some of the smallest things in a game that as a gamer you take for granted or never even notice, which is uh, is, is exciting and uh, an interesting road to learn at the same time, especially coming in from a, a person who wasn't educated in like the, the fundamentals of game design as a beginning uh, thing. And I learned it just by playing. Like I knew what I thought was bad game design just from playing video games with his Charlie and, and and our other uh, designer Tarek, you know, have a more fundamental idea of what is good and bad in game design from a from like a uh, like a core mechanics point of view. So yeah, I mean, and, and to kind of not to necessarily segue, but um, based on the other half of your question about what kind of led us to to mobile game design in particular mm -hmm. or mobile game development in particular, um, you know, I, I started my career working on PC games, uh, PC RTS games, so pretty okay. niche hardcore market in niche hardcore market. Um, and uh, it was a pretty interesting journey working. I mean, actually, I started uh, my, my first studio. I worked at a company called Lucky Chicken Games, uh, where I was kind of doing um, some kind of QA and office manager -y type stuff. And then I got an internship up at Maxis when I worked on Sims 2. Um, then I left that to go through it and work at a company called Liquid Entertainment, where I came in as an assistant producer and then eventually became a designer and then eventually became lead designer and then creative producer slash designer slash whatever needed doing uh, before we ultimately transitioned to this. So uh, I kind of cut my teeth in the quote unquote triple A, you know, third party um, console and PC world. And um, I think when we decided that we, my business partner and I, we decided we were going to go through and start in variable. We looked at mobile as a really unique opportunity. Not only was that time kind of, you know, uh, late 2010, early 2011, obviously it was right at the, kind of the cusp of the boom, yeah. um, so to speak. But, um, you know, there was just un tools like we never really seen before to be able to go through, independently develop your own games um, for multiple platforms, like using tools like Unity that were relatively low cost as opposed to stuff like Unreal, which at the time was pretty hefty licensing fees yeah. and whatnot. Um, and we could go through and self-publish the game. There was that opportunity to say, hey, if we're able to go through and hopefully get an Angry Birds at the time, um, nowadays a classic, but you know, whatever it is, there's an opportunity <laughs> for one of these games to go through and pop. Um, obviously, it was an exploding marketplace. And so from a business perspective, it made a lot of sense. From a creative perspective, one of the things that was really exciting to me was the fact that because mobile was inherently, you had to design your experiences to be a lot more focused. Um, you know, I think as a game designer, you're always, you know, I was making these bigger, you know, action RPG type titles. Yeah. There's a set of core features that are, these are the things that really make this game unique. However, in order to be competitive with these other key competitors on the market, we also need to have this, and we need to have this, and we need to have this, and we need to have this. And you kind of got this katamari of features that weren't even necessarily essential to the product, but because of marketing and to go through and get the, the deal signed and everything else as well, you needed to go through and do, which is part of the, you know, and it makes sense. You're trying to mitigate risk and you want to make sure you have a competitive yeah. product. But as an independent developer, you can really go through and hone in and say, let's go through and pick a small handful of mechanics that really work well together. Let's only add the features that we ultimately need. And then let's try and like squeeze as much interesting stuff out of those features as we can and mix and match them in cool and interesting ways um, in order to go through and really create something special that you know was also really you know polished. Um, and we could really dedicate that time to go through and polish the experience as opposed to having to feed so many mouths, so to speak. So um, I think the fact that it enabled us to kind of equip ourselves with the kind of focus necessary to deliver really polished inventive products that were really focused from a design perspective um, was really enticing to us as well. 
Interesting. It's a neat perspective to take on it, especially with, you know, kind of looking at the comparison between what you see in the market and what you see from the indie games realm. Well, looking kind of at your guys's, you know, portfolio, so to speak, in terms of what you guys have done with Hidden Variable, um, there's three major games, of course, you guys list out with, which the most recent one being Threes, which, of course, mm-hmm. you guys had recently that very successful, from what I heard, launch with the Xbox One. Um, yep. It was featured on quite a few websites I saw with it, and I had friends even coming to me mentioning the game, going, hey, have you heard of this game? And I kind of laughed, going, yeah, I know a little bit about it. You know, it was, it was interesting to kind of see with it. What, first off, I guess the biggest question is, what kind of motivated you guys to want to port that to the Xbox One in the first place? And was there an additional challenge that really came in? Because you, you're you seeing more of this now with not only indie games kind of getting ported from PC to console, but you're starting to see mobile games getting ported. And from personal experience, I haven't seen a lot of good results from it in terms of people trying to port them. But lately, I've seen a lot more of it. I think it. I think it. Honestly, it probably the genesis could be tracked back to even just um, the controls. The, the the problem that you run into a lot with uh, bringing a mobile game to console is the input. Um, mm-hmm. when, when you design for mobile, you are designing primarily for a touch screen. I mean, obviously, some games use accelerometers and 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 what have you. But the most successful games basically use touch input with mm-hmm. either multi-touch or uh, single touch input. So um, threes, however. Um, even though it uses touch input to play, the actual mechanics are not touch based at all. It's it's, it's just up, down, left, and right. Yeah. Um, and the 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 uh, fundamental rules of the game can basically apply to just about any way you could think about that uh, that input. So you can, with voice or you know you could even eventually do threes with those crazy like mind helmets where it's like just up, <laughs> down, left, right. You know what I mean? Oh so man. It, it, it actually. It was a pretty natural evolution, so we ended up having a conversation with Microsoft. Um, and we basically just kind of asked, like, "Hey, like, what do you think about threes on on Xbox?" And they're like, "That's cool. Let's let's maybe do it." And you know, we eventually got on the conversation of Snap Mode, which is kind of the big uh, cool little feature, or big cool little feature in the, on the Xbox version. And the game was already basically designed to kind of work in that view. So something like Snap Mode gave us a really cool, unique reason to bring it to that console. And we might not have, honestly, if, if the Snap Mode thing wasn't there. Like that was like a, a cool little challenge, both from an engineering point of view and from kind of like a, a sales point to give a user a reason to buy the game on that platform. And you always want to innovate a little bit in any kind of product that you're ultimately doing. You know, have a, have a certain amount of safe territory, but then always be trying something a little bit new and different. And so I think. Snap mode was definitely an interesting challenge for us, and it kind of represents an interesting foray, which we thought was really interesting about the Xbox One, which is kind of exploring this kind of next frontier of how we go through and consume content. This kind of, I know so many of us, you know, when I watch TV now, I watch TV while I'm playing games on my phone, and I kind of glance up, <laughs> and I glance down, and yep. it seems like it's, you know, we're we're making it much more cohesive by literally having both of the screens up on the TV yep. at the same time. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of an interesting evolution, and for some people it really connects and they ultimately love it. Other people are like, why the hell would you ever want to go through and play a game? <laughs> that's what I don't understand. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, different people have different uh, ways in which they go through and consume media, so it's a really interesting, uh, a really interesting application of that. Uh, one thing to note real quick in regards to Threes, and it's probably evident you may already know this, but just kind of for the record, the original developers of Threes were Servo, which Asher Bomer and Greg Woolwind. Um, yeah. And so we basically, they came to us uh, in part, they just launched it on iOS, um, and they were looking for someone to help them out to go through and bring it over to Android. We obviously develop on iOS and Android simultaneously. I've been friends with Asher for a long time, um, and we ended up figuring out a partnership. So we've been helping them go through and bring it to other platforms and help them optimize the game and localize and all that other good stuff. So um, just for context yeah. so that it doesn't, you know, yeah. I don't want to misrepresent the original. It's an amazing game, and, you know, it definitely wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for Asher and Greg and all the work they put well, into that. And that actually, that's actually a good point to talk about as well because it, it's it's – it's not like your traditional uh, porting relationship where developer A hires developer B to, to get it onto console B. Um, you know, it really feels like a true indie partnership. We we talk with those guys almost on a daily level, even a lot of it about nonsensical stuff. You know, um, we feel like it's more like just like a kind of friendship buddy uh, situation more than it feels like any kind of real business deal. And that's what's cool about it. Like we, it's it, you know, there there's there's a version of this. Where had it been a different developer, and we didn't really like, you know, the relationship that was there, we might not have done something like this. So this this made sense from both obviously like a like a business point of view from two companies trying to work together, but both also from just like a just kind of the the cool indie dev community point of view. Like we thought it was just yeah. a really good way to to kind of further our our uh, our um, kind of reach into that yeah. world. Um, and and it's exciting. Like it's it's 
it's more fun when it feels and is truly uh, kind of an organic, legitimate relationship. And that's, yeah, that's, well, that's yeah. important to us. That's part of the reason why we like to be an independent developer, because that kind of thing is important to us, versus just big deals on paper and moving forward to the next thing. Yep. And you're right. That's definitely something you see very unique to the indie community. Um, and that actually segues really well into another question we kind of had is, a lot of stuff we've seen talking to some other groups are, you know, these partnerships, these deals that you see with other companies, um, sometimes agreements for bringing different games together. So I guess I'll kind of phrase a generic question with, what is your kind of take as being part of the indie community? You know, you've kind of touched on it a little bit already, but do you feel it's more of a benefit for your own kind of, I guess, designer cred, so to speak? Or do you find it sometimes that the hindrance that comes at being an indie with not really having that AAA kind of reach and exposure or even the hype that seems to go into it? Do you find that that hindrance kind of gets in the way at times, or are you happy you don't even have to worry about it? Um, you know, I think, I think you know, indie means a lot of different things for a lot of different people, and the reality is, you know, we, we you kind of establish two extremes. One is like AAA, you know, 300 plus person development teams, and like yeah. one guy working out of his room or whatever it may be on the other. <laughs> Oftentimes, obviously, in the indie scene, it's a little where, somewhere in between, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that really the one thing that binds most indies together, I think, um, kind of philosophically, is um, people that are really only beholden to themselves to go through and make a great product, um, as opposed to being being beholden explicitly to a lot of other external interests, whether it's a publisher, whether it's a publisher's investors, whether it's a publisher's marketing team, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that does mean that we need to go through and figure all that stuff out ourselves yeah. because to be a sustainable indie, you need to go through and make games that will ultimately sell units that will help enable you to go through and make more games. Yeah. Um, so that burden ultimately ends up falling back on us. But at the same time, I think there's definitely a, a strong sense of ownership kind of from start to finish on an entire product. And I think that's healthy. I think it's important that you go through and be thinking about who is your audience ultimately going to be? Who are we going to go through and try and market this game to? What is this game and what is this game not? And making really strong decisions about that um, is a really important part of it. Um, you know, I, I think as a small studio where we're six folks, you know, so we're not huge by any means. Um, but, you know, we, we probably have some additional overhead related concerns like, you know, rent for the office and all the other miscellaneous stuff that goes into it. Um, so we generally, you know, we, we tend to be maybe a little bit more bottom line focused than some of the, the more esoteric crazy pants indies that are ultimately out there doing all sorts of crazy projects that may or may not sell and that's not what they're ultimately looking to do but i think it's amazing that we're, we're kind of in this environment nowadays where anybody pretty much anywhere with a computer can download some free tools if they invest the time and they have the passion and the energy they can just start making stuff and they can start sharing it and obviously we're connected enough that if there's a cool idea even if the game itself wasn't particularly well executed but there's an interesting vision there then that's something that'll be celebrated and they'll get that kind of positive reinforcement necessary to help them go through and make the next game and the next game and the next game and the next game and then they'll start collaborating with other people and then that's when really special things can ultimately happen so i think when we were in kind of more of a triple a only world and we were never really in a triple only world but when it seemed much more to be the case um, I think there was, you know, a much narrower set of perspectives that were ultimately being shared and expressed through the medium that is games. And it's awesome that there's really no limits to any of that stuff nowadays. Yeah. So, and I think, and just just one little quick thing to add to that is there's an interesting perception about indie game development. And I think there's kind of two extremes. You have the the one extreme, which is an indie game developer is just a developer that's not owned by a publisher or locked in with a publisher. And you have the other extreme, which is like, as Charlie mentioned, like some crazy esoteric, like programmed in a garage, amazing, uh, you know, artistic experience, indie developer. And both ends of the spectrum we love, like we're, you know, we're, we're, we're gamers through and through here. We love everything. But, you know, for us, we, we, you know, we still have, a, we have a small staff, but we do have a staff and it's a business. So it's, indie games is still a business for us but we I think we just want to approach it from a more of a masters of our own destiny point of view versus it being like a beholden to shareholders point of view and I think that's the big kind of important difference is that you know we still can uh, take pride in generating revenue and business off of something that we are truly proud of that we created yeah and I think one thing that hopefully you get with most indie games that you know uh, not to get too kind of sentimental about it but I think there's there's with with a larger product, even if you can appreciate the mechanics and how it was constructed and all the amazing art and everything that ultimately goes into it, oftentimes the product can ultimately end up feeling cold or the moments where you really connect with it are kind of few and far between. You remember those moments and those are really high points, but the rest of it is just kind of, I'm playing with a set of tools and a set of mechanics in a world and it's ultimately gratifying and I'm moving on to the next challenge and you know it's a good experience. But I think a lot of indie games, I think when they're ultimately at their best and there's generally um, kind of a, a higher percentage of these, at least in the indie community, where you really feel like you're kind of 
being invited into someone's home almost, mm -hmm. you know, and you're spending some time with them and this is something you can kind of feel the the team within the game itself and their personalities and their sense of humor, even if it's a little quirky and off-putting and you don't necessarily, it's not something you've necessarily <laughs> been exposed to before, you may not even agree with it, but it definitely feels like you're engaging with something that's very personal. Yeah. And I think I walk away after I've played an indie game with a very different kind of feeling than I walk away playing the latest AAA game that I've gone through and plugged into my console. And I think that's a really important balance to go through and have. And I think that sort of thing, those personal experiences, are probably just as likely to go through and inspire people to go through and make something of their own as well, which I think is really cool. I think the best example of that, of what Charlie just said, is the uh, end of Ridiculous Fishing. And spoiler alert, I mean, the game's, you know, obviously over a year old, so I don't feel that bad. But, you know, you play this kind of awesome arcade -y, you know, fishing uh, mobile indie game, and then the ending is like a crazy esoteric, like, comic about, like, relationships with fathers and stuff like that. And you're just like, whoa, where's that from? <laughs> it's super cool. Like, it's super cool. And, like, you know, in the AAA world, it'd be hard to get away with something like that. But in the indie world, yeah. it's like, check it out. And then yeah. they just, you know, kind of wait and see what happens. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think you see a lot of that in the indie realm with, you, you kind of mentioned the phrase getting away with, and I always, I always laugh because I swear some version of that statement has come up in every one of these interviews I've done. In the whole, the freedom you get as an indie, where you can do things that it's not that you couldn't do as a AAA. It's just there would be an unbelievable amount of either red tape or people looking down at you and saying, "Really, is that worth the money? Is that going to be worth the time?" Or instead, it can be, "Who cares if there's something interesting on it?" And I think we, as a community of, of gamers and, and people that critique, have finally realized that there is a very divergent difference between it. That you don't need, you know, five hundred million dollars to make the best possible graphics and game you can ever need yep. yes that's that's great for that experience i love playing those kind of games for the hugely cinematic experience you know activision blizzard always gets credit from my mind for making obscenely awesome cinematics that always seem to just fall off when you see the actual game design but there's a it's a very different experience than playing a game that is going to incite an emotional or more of an internal experience you know my first experience with indie i was not one that was big in indie or for a long time i got brought into it about a year ago and I'm so happy I did. But my first game ever was Braid, which I don't know if you guys have ever played. But yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the Braid, experience the of that game was was fun for so many reasons. Beyond the fact the soundtrack alone drew me in. It was kind of one of those where the soundtrack alone was like, yeah, this game's fun to play just to listen to. But the puzzles were difficult. They weren't hand holding. There was no you know three hour tutorial to you know trudge your hand through the whole thing. It was like you had to get into it, and you had to rack your head against the wall for it. And you put all that time and effort to it, and then. You know, spoilers for anybody that hasn't played it, but you get to the very end of it, and the ending was just fantastic. It was a cool, awesome feeling of this total flip around where, you know, you're actually playing as the villain. And I thought that was something that was so well executed, so well done, that I've seen bigger games try that always feels predictable. It's always like, oh yeah, I can tell this is coming. That was one of the first times I went, yeah, totally didn't see that coming, even though when I played through it again, I saw all the different clues I had missed. It's just... It's a totally different experience, and I don't look back at that game and try to compare it to the AAA. And I think that's the biggest mistake and, people make. And I, I completely agree with that. And I think you know you can kind of put it in the context of film, like uh, mm -hmm. obviously, like in just in media arts in general, where we're kind of on a very good indie uh, surgeons right now. But um, it, you know, those the big games they're necessary. I think they're necessary not only just obviously to, to keep our industry in a in a in a state of competitive marketplace that is you know advantageous for business, but also, like, imagine if one day you went to the movies and the diehards and the Transformers and all those of the world, they just stopped making those movies completely. As predictable as those movies are, that would not be fun. It would not yeah. be fun because then you mean you'd be going to the movies and just constantly getting kind of like these heavier, grittier experiences. And sometimes yeah. you just want to go turn your brain off for two and a half hours. Yeah. And I kind of feel the same way about video games. <laughs> I still play Call of Duty. I still play Battlefield. I still play all those yeah. games. But I also still scour the internet and play, you know... Uh, crazy ASCII art indie games that I have to leave open my browser open for for three months to get through it. You know, like so. <laughs> I, I think you kind of need both ends of the spectrum, or one side would start to become a little too mundane without the other. I think it's a kind of necessary yin yang right there. And I think it's you know, Braid. I think was a gateway game for a lot of people. You know, as their first exposure to those types of things. So I think for a long time, indie games meant like, oh, you mean like a student project or yeah. a freeware, <laughs> like, like Darwin, or, or like a like browser that, yeah. game. You got yeah. it. So like light version of another experience you could play that maybe has a neat idea that they couldn't get away with. Yeah. Your terminology, you know, elsewhere. I think Braid for a lot of people was a big eye opener, not just because of look at all these, you know, all the reasons you already mentioned, but just the inventiveness of the mechanics. This is a great experience that's unlike anything I've played before that really stands alone. And I don't, I don't. 
recall, I should know, um, where Braid was first released, but was, Xbox, was it on Xbox? Xbox? And so it's yeah. say. kudos for the folks at, at Microsoft, and yeah. then I know ultimately a lot of the folks at Sony who've also gone through to embrace the indie community yeah. to really say, yeah. let's go through and give these guys an audience. Let's create a dedicated channel through which um, a lot of these games can really go through and shine, because I think, you know, if it wasn't for the major console manufacturers putting a giant tile on your dashboard saying, check out this weird new thing, you know, it may, you may not be where we are today. Yeah. You know, and obviously mobile's helped a lot with that too, but I think this is great confluence of events that's really come together. And it all goes from, you know, people who are in positions of authority that are playing great games that want yeah. to go through and, and have them be seen. And I think as long as you, you make something that you're really proud of, that's a unique reflection of kind of who you are and what you would love to go through and play that you think other people would dig as well, you can go through and, uh, you know, and, and share it with folks and you never know when it can go through and, and hit a thing. Yeah, we're lucky to work in a really self-supportive industry. Um, I have friends in all walks of life in the game industry. I have friends that are the, the, the guys that are in their basement, you know, just programming their own games for fun and have daytime jobs. Yeah. And I have friends who are you know, uh, like multiplayer producers like inside Sony first party. And thankfully, we all consume the same content and are, we're excited to play games for the same reason for the most part. And, and I think a lot of other industries, a lot of friends that work in things like music and movies, they're very critical of each other. And I think in the game industry, we are too, but we still want to play the game because it's fun. You know what I mean? I think that's the kind of great advantage that the industry has right now is that we are going to have guys like Chris Charla, who runs uh, ID at Xbox at Microsoft. He's the guy that took the chance on threes because he's just a... He's just a total gamer. He's a total fan of the industry. And just because he works at a giant uh, corporation has nothing to do with his want and, and you know even need to kind of push this cool stuff through. And the same thing's happening at Sony uh, with guys like um, Nick Sutner there. And the yeah. same things are happening now at Nintendo. We're seeing some really cool stuff. Honestly, I even I for a long time thought Nintendo would never even really jump into this world. And yet you can get on to the... <laughs> the store on your DS and download some crazy stuff that you've never even heard of, which is super cool. And obviously PC and, and, and Mac and, and mobile is, is pretty open. So yeah. we're lucky. We're in a really lucky time to be able to have a business like this and be supported by all, all the different types of people in the industry. Yeah, it's definitely, as Nick mentioned, I think we're, you know, when we come into, when we run into a problem, it's not a, holy crap, how are we going to go through it? I mean, there's always those moments, but yeah. part of one of our next steps is like, who can we talk to? Yeah. Let's reach out to not only people we know and people that we've met, obviously we've got a pretty pretty good network yeah. going so far, but there might be like, man, that game on the store did a really good job. Let me go through and poke around and find that guy's name on Twitter and reach yeah. out to him and say, hey, can we chat for a second? We're curious how you went through and tackled this particular problem. Yeah. And yeah. nine times out of 10, they're just more than happy to go through and respond and everyone's super friendly, eager to go through and just say, lay it all out on the table. So, you know, we can all kind of benefit from each other's experiences. And given that the industry especially now it's changing so quickly you know everyone pretty much needs to be chatting at all times yep. in order to properly understand and plan and make the best decisions for your product moving forward so GDC is so much more intense than it used to be in terms of just business talk <laughs> it really is like when I first started going to GDC especially as a, as a journalist it felt very very uh, easy in terms of like oh well this is what's plans we're going to talk about and here you go but now you get in the coffee shops and stuff at GDC and there are people just, you know, like, they're like, we gotta figure this out and they're having intense conversations about their next projects and everyone's working on something and they're working on something on the side and so I think <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very fast moving industry for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, even if you just look at the numbers, I mean, the numbers alone make a huge difference with it. You know, we've, we've done, I've done our research onto it and you, know, you go back just two years and you could probably fit into a word document the amount of any companies that existed that anybody ever paid attention to today mm -hmm. i couldn't if i started naming every indie company that i know personally i don't think i could finish before the end of the day it's yeah. an un it's an obscene growth in the industry and what's been great about it is there's been three things that have happened in the industry that i think are just fantastic beyond the fact that you have this redefining of indie and you guys kind of touched on it a little bit where yeah, you go back to the old days, you know, indie games were these artistic or student projects, or I always used to think of them as, you know, retro refits. So, hey, we decided to take this old game and we're going to bring it to the PC. And so it was, oh, you know, it's 8-bit, 16-bit, whatever. And then, especially in the last six months, there's been this huge surge of now games that, in my opinion, rival the AAA, you know, companies in terms of, of graphical quality, um, you know, soundtracks and even gameplay. And you realize that this is developed by an indie group. This is developed by a team of, you know, four or six people and yeah. cost, you know, hundred and eight, you know, cost, you know, eight hundred thousand dollars as opposed to the three hundred plus million this other company spent. And I think the internet being what it is today, people talking in the community, there's been a lot more people that are looking at those companies, the big name companies, and saying, What is that money really going to? How are they able to do this with that? And yet you're asking for this. 
for stuff that games that come out, you know, not properly released, servers aren't, you know, working right, and they're doing, you know, day one patching and whatnot. And what's cool about it is I think both sides push it. The AAAs push the indie groups to try to step up some of the graphics and what they're doing, while the indies are also kind of showing the AAAs that there is competition outside of, you know, the, the three big companies out there. And so it's been a neat kind of piece of it. I think a lot of it just comes down to the industry has finally hit a growth point. For whatever reason it happened in the last couple of years, I don't know. I don't really know why it happened lately with it, but I know personally I love it, and it's great to see it coming to the consoles too. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of it. You know, as a PC gamer myself, you know that was always you saw on the PC, but the market is definitely larger on the consoles. So once you start getting those games exposure on, you know, Microsoft and, and PlayStation and whatnot, you'll start making a difference, and hopefully you'll start seeing more and more of that kind of design premise instead of you know the 86,000th clone of Call of Duty coming out next year. <laughs> exactly. yeah. It's nice to see that unique piece, and I think what's even better is. You no longer it's no longer exclusive you don't have to be an indie gamer or a triple a gamer you can be both it's acceptable much like you can go right. see the transformers movie and the big blockbuster movie while also going and seeing an independent film i think that stereotype is kind of broken down a bit which has helped out a ton for it as well totally agree. It's neat to I think there's, there's a cool um there's a cool story in, in what we're talking about uh, other ocean is a legendary uh, company for working on like IP and ports and stuff like that. I and mean, their portfolio of the sheer amount of games they've actually worked on as a company is staggering. It's impressive. <laughs> and, but most of it was, you know, like I said, IP or porting based, but now they're in a world where, you know, in their free time, their creative director, uh, Mike Micah, who's uh, pretty well known in game development, just made his own game called IDARB and they were able to put it on Xbox, you know, one. And now they're able even to start working on their own, you know, original stuff it, it, because of the way the systems are set up, you know, mm -hmm. even one generation ago, you could do it, but it was really hard. And the generation before that, you just couldn't do it. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, in, as, the, as the generations move on, and especially now with these systems being, you know, software patchable and all that kind of stuff, it's, you know, it's really up to companies like Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo to decide how easy they want it to be for games to get on the system. And I personally think easier is better because, um, you know, I want more content on these consoles too. I want to know that, like, hey, I bought this console. There's a bunch of stuff for me to play, and it's not all, you know, fifty, sixty dollar games every time. I can go spend <laughs> six bucks and go play a game for almost as long as I would that sixty dollar game. Yeah. yeah. No, I know what you mean, and I, and I agree. The variant content's big, and I think, I think in the next generation of consoles, we'll finally start seeing a lot more release titles with indie. I think that's one way they really miss the bucket. Was you know, with both systems being released, a lot of people complain about the lack of games. Well, what a great way to kind of supplement that by start introducing a bunch of indie games. You know, offer 20, 30 of these great indie titles. And seriously, it's not like you couldn't make a list of the top 100 indies that you know are going to sell on the consoles. Like, I mean, yeah. there's an unbelievable amount of it. And even just looking at the PlayStation Plus numbers as a, as a Sony person myself, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Binding of Isaac, a bunch of the games that have come out and just the sales numbers yeah. is insane. And it's like, if anybody yeah. wants to point that and say, oh, you know, indie's not really the money is, are you are you shitting me? Like, you go, you've got these games that are, are blowing it away. And honestly, the marketing part of it, you know, from a gamer perspective, it's a lot easier to justify 15 bucks to try a game than it is to justify 60 bucks to try a game. And I think that's that's a huge, huge marketing point. And then, yeah, as you start getting that more content, I think we'll really see a big burst of that in the next consoles. Because this is going to be the console generation that, you know, finally accepts indies as a standard, you know, genre realm instead of this, you know, as you said, student projects. I think on the next system, you'll see plenty of indie games coming out with it at release because you need to. There's also, I mean, it's it's the kind of first generation where people are really getting comfortable not having a box product. You know, that mm -hmm. digital downloads of games yeah. is like it's becoming a, oh, cool, I can get it day one. I'm going to start pre-downloading it now. Like that whole notion yeah. just took a long time for people to kind of slowly but surely <laughs> get over that. And there was instances where I was totally on board from the get-go, but then like only per earlier this year with comics, you know, I always was buying yeah. trade and whatnot, I just got into digital comics. I'm like, oh my God, this is so much easier. Um, yeah. But it's more dangerous because I can impulse buy. But right. regardless, it's just kind of... <laughs> they love that. The uptick, and I think, given the fact that obviously indie games are never going to go through and have a presence, really, I mean, the rare exception in a, you know, in a GameStop or, you know, whatever right. it may be, or a Best Buy, um, you know, the fact that people get more comfortable making these digital purchases um, on their consoles as a primary means of consumption. I'm going to browse yeah. the store on my machine as opposed to yeah. getting in my car and going somewhere. Um, it only works out well for indies as well. So I tell you, I actually kind of think this console is not only going to help evolve the way the indies can, you know, uh, get onto things like Xbox, but I also think this is going to be a little bit of a make or break uh, generation in general for console games. I kind of think, you know, I don't, I don't, at least personally, think that a a traditional game console will work next generation. Like they're going to have to figure something out. Hmm. You know, like Xbox, you know, four might not be as viable when 
in you know six or seven years when how long these things are supposed to last who knows what we're going to have like the ex yeah. the rapid acceleration of of computing right now is is mind blowing it's moving yeah. faster than moore's law it's it's yeah. You know, like your iPad, if, you know, if I could plug my iPad into my TV and sync a controller to it, I'd be playing tons of games, you know what I mean? Yeah. It would be the brain of my system. So we'll see what happens with that. Honestly, I, I kind of think, you know, maybe it might become more modular. I'm not really sure where it'll go, but I, I think, you know, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo are definitely going to have to think up some interesting things to kind of keep this <laughs> cycle going. Yeah. I think it's a coin flip as to which direction they'll go because, I mean, from my personal standpoint, of it, I never would have guessed that mobile gaming would have gone the way it did. And you guys being kind of in that realm of it, you know, it's, I, if somebody would have told me four years ago that, yeah, there was going to be this, as many people doing mobile games and not just, you know, Angry Birds and Tetris and crap like that, but actual, like, you know, full on RTSs and stuff like that. I've been All like, right. you got to be kidding me. At the same time, four years ago, I said I'd never buy a smartphone. So, and this was the first year I actually ever bought one, like around release and was like, I actually need this smartphone going. It's just, you never know what's going to come up in three, four years. I think modular is going to be the way they're going to go just because every other piece of the technological market is moving that way. You know, Samsung's doing a lot with the modular realm. Um, Intel's doing a lot with that as well. I have a hard time believing that's not the direction they'll go. Right. But I also get worried because even this generation's consoles were very behind the ball with, with cost and release because, you know, one of the big things I thought they missed was solid state drives. You know, the, the consoles came out and they didn't release with solid states, which I felt was just a huge miss because the systems, while they're powerful and can do a bunch of great things, feel slower than the previous generation. That was one of the biggest annoyances I had and the biggest things people talk about. And I think as you kind of push forward with it, it'll be interesting to see what they do to kind of combat if they stay behind with it. But I know you guys have to get going soon with it, so um, I did want to wrap it up with uh, a quick question I have with it, which is, are there any games on the docket that you guys are currently working on that you want to kind of pitch, market, advertise? Oh, I wish we could. We could. We could probably, <laughs> it's, a, it's probably a couple months out before we have stuff to share. But, you know, we, we have a couple of interesting irons in the fire, so to speak, that we're, we're looking forward to sharing a little bit more information about. Um, we, we don't really have any immediate plans for when we're going to be disclosing it, but, um, yeah. you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. But um, they're, they're hopefully on the docket for later this year. Yeah, so. yeah cool. No, I just always, always, always want to give you guys a chance to, you know, help oh, sure. yeah, like that there's something going on. Um, yeah. But I swear every time we get that same answer, it's always just like, yeah, there is. We'd love to talk about it, but, you know, yeah. all those kind of pieces with it. But, well, I mean, oddly enough, you guys covered a lot of the elements I wanted to cover without me even oh, having cool. to ask the question, which was right. awesome, um, which is kind of why I like doing these things too with it. But so I do want to thank you guys for the time. I really do appreciate yeah. it. Um, it's great learning about it. As someone who, like I said, is not a huge mobile game person, um, I've definitely gotten way more into it lately, and I kind of just laugh because... It's never what I thought it would be. Um, and I had a chance. I downloaded threes, and I got a chance to play around with it. And it is as addictive as everyone said it would be, which, <laughs> crap, because um, it definitely blew away quite a bit of time the first time I downloaded it. So um, well done. And it's it's neat to see because it, it seems like such a simple game, but it really is a lot of fun. I was I was kind of impressed. Yeah, um, if you're, if you're interested doing, in that, so. I don't know if you've seen it already, but um, you know, Asher and Greg went through and posted a giant blog entry about the entire creation of threes because threes oh, okay. um, was you know we talk about different indie developer scenarios yeah. um asher's out here in la um greg is out in chicago um okay. and so they developed that entire game over the course of you know 15 months or so um basically over email yeah um <laughs> so they have a log of every single creative decision conflicts yeah you know asher shared text messages with friends that he was playtesting it with when they found exploits and weird issues with the logic yeah. and how they went through and worked around it. So they, they really laid everything bare, including all their frustrations and their dark times and yep. everything else as well. So it's a, it's a great snapshot. It's a little bit of a long read, maybe a, a Sunday afternoon read. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's rare that you, you see, you know, not only people being willing to be so candid to kind of share all that information, but it's, but it's just yeah, like every single stage laid out. Yeah, without... it's every email verbatim in the whole chain, which is kind of crazy. Right, that's... That's impressive. That's like, you know, that's better than Sony getting hacked. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Cool. Well, cool. thanks, Ben. Stay warm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll do. <laughs> thanks for your time, guys. Have fun. Yeah, right. Take care. Yep.